Okay, I don't hate it. I think we're okay. Um, we're gonna let this roll and see what happens. So, guys, as I was saying, today everything changes because your experiences in the first unit in this class at some level were dictated by how much you remembered from last year. Um, guys, today the slate has been wiped clean and we are all, if you will, equally ignorant. Um, and as a result, it means that we get to learn and develop ideas together uh, because we're all starting at square one and building into these things. Um, so guys, with that said, turn to chapter five, the beginning of chapter five, and let's talk about what we're building into. So guys, here's where we are. We are now starting a unit on thermochemistry. You obviously see the title on page 161. But guys, this is actually a two chapter unit. But interestingly, the other chapter is chapter 19. Um, so if you go back to chapter 19, let's just do that quickly, and sort of stick a finger in chapter 19, and then, guys, if you can sort of flip back and forth, um, you'll notice chapter 15 is thermochemistry. And I understand that you can parse that word. And thermo is energy, and chemistry is what we do, so it's the energy of chemistry. But then, guys, back in chapter 19, it's chemical thermodynamics. And so we're taking, again, the word thermo and talking about dynamic, which means changing. And guys, I actually talked with Eugene about this, again, the author of the book, right? And I'm like, hey, why did you separate those so significantly, um, chapter uh, 5 from 19? And his answer, we say this a lot, was chapter 17. Um, because guys, chapter 17 is all about equilibria. And so his thought was that you needed to know equilibria in order to know chapter 19. Um, my response was, I'm dealing with second year students who already understand equilibria at some level, and as a result, I'm going to mush these together, and it was like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, guys, we're going to do 5 and 19 together. Here's the deal. Um, when you summarize chapter 5, do not go to chapter 19. Guys, we will later in the unit summarize chapter 19 using exactly the same format we're doing on chapter 5. But guys, I know this is about to become the forbidden fruit and some of you can't help yourselves. But guys, do not look at chapter 19 until we're done with chapter 5. It will hurt you. Okay? Please. I know some of you are flipping there now. What could be so bad? Guys, don't look at chapter 19. It will mess you up like you have no idea. Uh, so guys, today we're going to start in chapter 5. So go back to chapter 5 with me. Did any of you start your chapter summary? You did? I'm going. Perfect. So guys, so Sharp has started. If you didn't, that's fine. I didn't expect it. But from having done maybe the first two sections... Do you understand why I chose that format? Because it's kind of, it's different from the last one. The last, like the last section we did, yeah. a lot more like concepts and stuff. This one's very mathematical. So right. There's a lot of like equations and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just liked how you have a space for diagrams. Yeah. I, I, on the last format we did. Absolutely, yeah. And so now all of a sudden you're pulling together what is now becoming mathematical. Not that the other one wasn't stoichiometry and stuff, but different math. Equations. And then you've got a place for diagrams, yeah? Um, for the question section, yeah. I was doing it, and I don't think I had any specific questions. No, that's Just fine. Like... Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, so guys, Piper is saying, I know there was a quadrant there for questions. What if I don't have any? Because this is for you. 
Understand, if you don't have any, just you're fine. Don't worry about it. It means I don't have to teach you because you've already learned just it all. It's just an overall question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know how to like pinpoint yeah. it. So. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. totally fine. So guys, with all of that said, let me explain to you the way this entire unit is going to go. Um, so in chapter five, excuse me, in chapter five, guys, today, we are going to talk about energy and energy transfer. We are going to end the day today. This is actually really fun. Um, guys, we are going to end the day today by talking about this block of brass. And you're going to find that when we break out this block of brass at the end of class today, you're going to have the opportunity to really stress test your understandings and really take ownership for, yeah, I understand. Now, guys, we need to say this right now. Please hear this. Um, physics. A lot of you have done physics, right? Yes? No? No? I'll say it, and then maybe it's not even going to be an issue for you. Guys, in physics, you learned about frame of reference. Maybe that rings or maybe it doesn't. But guys, if you understand the idea of frame of reference, we're going to talk about that today as well. But guys, you need to understand physics and chemistry do these differently. In physics, your frame of reference is always outside of the event that's taking place. You are an external observer. Guys, in chemistry, it's the opposite. You are inside of the event that's taking place. Why does that matter? All the signs change. So if you have drilled into physics and you're like, I know that my frame of reference is external, your frame of reference needs to become internal um, because it changes all the signs. So we needed to get that out there at first. So guys, here's how this is going to go. Today we're going to talk about fundamentals about energy. What are the types? How do we change it? And how do we measure it? Then guys, at the end of this, we're going to do our little block thing and that'll be our day. Then we're going to move beyond that and we're going to start tying this to chemistry and we're going to talk about how do we measure the energies of reactions. And you're going to find there's two ways to do it and that's going to lead us into our first lab. We're going to go into lab, we're going to build calorimeters and we're going to actually go and measure energies of reactions. Then guys, as we get deeper into that, we're going to start talking about the idea of spontaneity. Why do reactions happen on their own? And why do some not happen on their own? Guys, that is going to be our springboard into chapter 19. I'm just going to tell you right now. In chapter 19, we're going to bring a new idea into our vocabulary, which is called entropy. The disorder of the universe. And guys, when we bring entropy into the conversation in chapter 19, we're then going to be able to definitively say, why do some reactions happen on their own? And why do some reactions not happen on their own? And we're going to do that through a lens called Gibbs free energy. So guys, um, this is how we'll start every unit. We'll start by doing an overview of what we're doing. Again, guys, you understand the logic, right? Scaffolding. For the same reason that we summarize chapters, we scaffold together because that gives you structure that you can hang new ideas on. Yo? Yo. All right. So guys, one more thing we need to talk about and we're going to get started. We need to call a truce. <laughs> we're idiots. Uh, so nobody loves a good meme more than this guy. <laughs> okay, finally someone's going to say something about it. <laughs> the earth had to delete some of them. And the only thing better than a good meme, well, it's not true, could be a good chemistry. Well, there's no such thing as a good chemistry meme. So, oh, I thought the one about the kid Actually, in the chair was pretty good. No, because here's the problem, honey. If you say that, you're encouraging the behavior. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Mr. I'm sorry. You're, I'm you're right. All the good ones are gone. <laughs> If I thought I could do it, I would leap over James and just smack him. <laughs> that was horrible. Oh, I know. Okay, so but guys, in all seriousness, um, I um, so the 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 uh, group meeting that we put together, 
Um, it's obviously meant to be conversational, but you also have to understand there are very few things on my phone that I allow notifications from. Very, very few things. And one of the things that I allow notifications from is this year's group me. I silence all of the, I have them all from years ago. Because yours is the only one I allow. And so as a result, I let my phone ding. Um, and guys, I shut that off when I go to bed. But during the day, I let it go. And eventually, guys, this is going to turn into chicken little and the sky is falling. And I'm just going to stop paying attention. Um, and that could be a problem if somebody has a legitimate question. Which is not to say don't throw memes around. Um, I just can't be a part of that. Um, and so please, if you want to do that, create another group me. Um, you could even include me in that group me and I'll just shut off notifications. Because, sorry, I mean, some of them were funny. Yeah, they were. Some of them were. <laughs> not most. <laughs> but a select few were actually funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which ones, but you know who you are. <laughs> I used to make jokes about the noble gas. Stop! I don't anymore because they never get any reaction. <laughs> okay, that one was funny. All right. All right, so guys, and I'm not in any way suggesting we're going to do this. Oh, no, this book? Oh, oh no. Oh. Which book are we talking about? Oh, <laughs> this is the totally bonkers chemistry joke book. Oh, boy. Yes! Oh, boy. <laughs> Three years ago, we started a class tradition of having a, uh, a in the same way that you're our staple yeah. inspector, yeah. we uh, had a class joke teller. Yeah. Um, that's their tradition. No, we're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it. No, we're not. We're doing it. I brought it up, but it's not your stuff. You didn't think of it. They did. Well, you we're stealing their ideas. No, you can't. That's it's a tradition. Is, Look at no, that. it's not. It, it can be. Said, so. We're going to make the tradition. But guys, seriously, if you want to create another group me where you want to toss stuff like that, let's let the current group me be academic. And if you want to create another group me for other things, that's fine. You can even put me in it. Um, I'll just silence it. And then I'll catch up on the crazy when I have time. Um, but I need this group me to not always be popping me because eventually I'm just going to shut it off. Um, so anyway, there you have it. All right, you guys ready to go? Grab something you can take notes with and on. And guys, be selective about what you write down. Some of this... Hello? 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 Okay. So guys, some of this will be familiar to you. Um, some of this won't be. As I mentioned earlier, some of this will just be backwards if you've taken physics. But guys, today what we're going to do is we're going to establish a framework. And guys, this framework is going to be critical throughout this unit. Guys, so critical, and I'll just tell you right now, I told you we're going to do a lab calorimetry where we're going to measure the chemistry of reactions. And then, guys, the second lab that we do in this unit, you guys are actually going to do the calorimetry lab over without any instructions. And you're going to go into lab, and you're going to study a different type of chemical process, and you're going to gather and analyze all your data. I'm going to show you how to do that with a spreadsheet. Um, and after you have gathered and analyzed your data, what we're going to do is we are going to allow each of your spreadsheets to populate a master spreadsheet. So all of your results will show up in one master spreadsheet. And we're going to project that spreadsheet on the wall. And you're going to fight with each other about whose data is best. Now, guys, here's the thing. Many of you are going to get tanked in that conversation. And we're going to talk up front. No hurt feelings. You are not your numbers. We're all going to learn together. But guys, many times the reason that you get tanked in these conversations is because you don't understand today. 
So guys, today we are establishing frameworks that will guide our understanding of, and guys, this is, this is complicated, that will guide our understanding of this conversation for the rest of the year. Guys, the stuff that we're going to learn this unit, especially in chapter 19, is fundamental to everything we're going to talk about for the rest of the year. So let's build slowly. So guys, when we talk about energy, I think probably the first thing we ought to do, sort of makes sense, guys, the first thing we probably ought to do if we're going to talk about energy is we should define it. So you ready? Thermochemistry is the study of energy changes in chemical reactions. You get that. You don't even need to write it down. But guys, the critical term here is energy. What is energy? Guys, you hear energy. I'm low energy today. If you're paying attention to science, dark energy. 60% of our universe is made of dark energy, and we don't even know what it is. It's dark. Guys, but fundamentally, what is energy? So guys, if you were pushed for a definition of energy, what would you say? Talk to the person next to you. So those are units. Guys, final thoughts, and we're going to pull this together. All right, so guys, allow me to guide the conversation, if you would, please. Um, so two thoughts relative to energy. First of all, this. If I were in your shoes, without having a degree in chemistry, I would struggle with this. We all talk about energy really freely. But guys, at the end of the day, to think about what it actually is, is very difficult. Um, so the one thing that I heard people talk about that we need to rein in right now is movement. Guys, energy does not require movement. It can be expressed in movement, but guys, understand that energy itself is not movement. And it also does not have to move from one place to the other. And it doesn't even have to cause movement. So guys, here's the scoop. Last year in general chemistry, I don't know if you remember, we established a fundamental definition for energy. We said it's this, the ability to change something. And that was fine for general chemistry. But guys, that is not the actual working definition for energy. But it is related. So guys, let's dig deeper. Ready? We got to talk about this word change. So guys, if I'm going to move my book, that requires energy. If I'm going to heat up my hands, that requires energy. Guys, energy is the ability to change things. But the question is this, how do you change things? You ready for the interesting answer? And guys, understand, a lot of the stuff that you're going to learn today, you're going to look at this and you're going to be like, okay, I get it. This is just freshman college chemistry. Never thought about that. AP is a just. This is just freshman college chemistry. And when I get to college, they're going to tell me all the real stuff. Because this is it. This is all you got. This universe that we live in, there's only two ways to change things. Work and heat. And guys, that's it. That's it. If you want to change something, you either have to do work on it or transfer heat with it. That's it. That is not dumbed down freshman chemistry, guys. That is the exhaustive list. That's all you got. If you want to do, if you want to change something, the only way to do it is by doing work on it, or it could do work on you, or heat it up or cool it down. That's it. That's the list. Yeah? 
Okay, so guys, fundamental number one. How do you change something? Work and heat and that's it, good? Okay, now guys, this. We are going to move into another conversation. So not how do we change things, but the two types of energy. Do you know what they are? You guys know this, come on. <laughs> Potential and kinetic. kinetic. Let's do kinetic first. So guys, this sounds strange, but in this class, they've actually written most of the kinetic energy calculations out of the curriculum. We used to have to figure out kinetic energies of gas particles based on their temperature and their mass and their, their mean free path and all this other stuff. Oh, there it is. Uh, if you grab your equation sheet, hey, by the way, grab your equation sheets. <laughs> so guys, if you grab your equation, does anyone need them? Y'all good? Okay, so guys, look at the page four side, and you'll notice under the section that says gases, liquids, and solutions, um, the, the, the third to the bottom equation is Ke, kinetic energy of a molecule. Guys, we used to have to solve for average kinetic energies of samples, and we should talk. You guys understand this? This is fundamental, guys. Stop reading and hear this. If you have a sample of a gas, not all the particles are moving the same speed, right? Some are moving faster than others. How can we make them all move faster? Heat it up. Make them all move slower. Cool it down. You understand that, right? We used to have to calculate average kinetic energies for samples of gases. Now all we have to do is the kinetic energy of one particle. And guys, that equation, which you may know from physics, is one half mv squared. So with that in mind, let's do this. So guys, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. I think most of you know that. And then guys, finally, We'll just write it down. Energy kinetic, this is the way you abbreviate it. It's different in the book or in the AP sheet. It's one half mv squared. Yeah, and, we, and that's what I want to talk about is, is what these mean. It's not volume. Um, waiting for this to turn on. Um, so guys, it goes like this. The V, ah, the V is not volume. Um, the, so here, and you need to know this. So guys, the M is mass, but it has to be in kilograms. And then guys, the V is not volume, it is velocity. Oh, and we should do units meters per second. So guys, we're going to talk about this in a second, but let me do a little bit of foreshadowing. And maybe you know. Guys, what are our units for energy? Do you know? Joules. Joules in the SI system, the metric system. And, but there's another unit for energy, yes. the calorie. So we're accustomed to the calorie. Guys, we're going to use the joule. We'll talk about it more later. But guys, why do these units matter? And here's why. Kinetic energy is measured in joules. So guys, what is a joule? A joule is the amount of energy that one kilogram sorry, two kilograms have traveling one meter per second. Why do this I think it's two? Um, yeah, good question. So guys, let me explain to you what this might look like. So for analogy purpose, what weighs two kilograms? Two liters of soda. Right? A liter weighs about a kilogram if it's pure water, it's close enough. So guys, imagine that you have two liters of water
traveling at one meter per second. And if this meter, if this runs into a wall, it transfers its energy into the wall, and the energy that it would transfer would be one joule. So guys, how did they come up with these numbers? Well, do the math. If you take one half mv squared and plug in two for the mass, kilograms, and plug in one for the velocity, two divided by two is one, one squared is one, and one times one is one. So guys, the actual units for a joule are kilogram meters per second. We'll talk more about that later. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that later. For now, just so you know. So the faster something moves, and the heavier it is. Yeah, and we're okay for time, so we'll talk about it. This is sort of a really strange but an interesting <coughs> application of that thought. So, like back in World War II, military rifles were deer rifles. They were thirty off sixes. Um, a stinking huge chunk of lead. And that huge chunk of lead had a really big mass, but it was hard to make it go really fast. And so the government coming out of World War II, moving into Korea and Vietnam, realized we can create more effective weapons by using a smaller projectile with the same amount of powder behind it. And so what they did is they moved away from the 30-06 into the 223, which is what M16s and things are. But the idea is that, that a, uh, a 223 round is much, much lighter. So the, where can I get this? Is equal to 1 half mv squared. So the idea is the mass went down. We're now using a lighter projectile, but the velocity goes up. And that's the idea. Because the velocity is squared, the energy that you lose from mass, you more than make up for in velocity, and now you're transferring more energy through that projectile. Yeah, crazy, right? Yeah. All right. So, guys, you good on these ideas? All right, here we go. So, let's see what happens. That's good. We're good there. All right, so are we feeling pretty comfortable with, with kinetic? All right, so guys, let's go potential. Guys, here comes big idea number two. In the same way that you probably struggled maybe with defining energy, or you should have, I do. Now we know it's just the ability to do work or transfer heat. We're going to talk about work and heat more in a minute. Guys, potential energy is stored energy. <coughs> you ready for a deep thought? How do you store energy? Talk about it. How do you store Talk about it, guys. How do you store energy? <laughs> Guys, finish up your thoughts. All right, guys, come back together if you would, please. So, great conversations about how we store energy, but I'm going to turn a different question to you. Where do we store energy? You were talking about one with trap doors. Uh, like if you put a block on a pad and then yep. have it able to open a trap door yep. and fall somewhere. Okay, so we can store energy using gravity. Where else do we store energy, please? Well, that would involve mass and gravity as well. Where else? Like the nucleus of an atom. Okay. <coughs> we can store energy in the nuclei of atoms. Where else? In bonds, potentially? In chemical bonds. 
Can you give me examples of chemical bonds storing energy? I don't know. Like, like, so let's think about where you use like energy. Combustion reactions. Your car. Guys, gasoline is a bunch of carbons and hydrogens bonded together, and there's energy. We'll talk more about how, but there's energy stored in those bonds. And your car or truck extracts that energy and turns it into go, right? You ready for this? Guys, think about this. That energy that is stored in the gasoline creates work. It's moving the car. And it creates heat. Huh? Okay, so guys, let's keep going. Where else do we store energy? In a battery. Batteries. Where else do we store energy? In cells. Food. But again, can we say that that relates back to bonds? Go ahead. In like tanks full of hydrogen and stuff. Good. And so again, can we do? We, is it is it okay to say that That's that comes back to bonds? It's, like yeah. it's a reaction. Other places, and we don't need to beat a dead horse. I don't even know what that means. We can be done with this. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, good. yeah, yeah. That's it's. Sorry, my mind is wandering. They're doing really interesting things now with storing energy by using pumps like solar. Sun shines in the day, right? But we don't need the energy in the day, we need it at night. So there are some are looking at using solar to pump air into a tank, creating really high pressures. And then at night, they let the air flow out and it runs a turbine. I really like that. And also some stuff where like, they use it to pump water up. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the name of that is actually pumped hydro. Yeah, it's like the world's biggest battery. They pump water into an upper reservoir during the day, and then at night they let it flow back down and run the turbines. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just kind of like thinking because everything, you know, uh, it's just so hard to explain. For like, for like anything everywhere, there's energy always, you know? So, because yeah. it's just kind of hard to think about like where energy is stored. Yeah, right. Every single thing has yeah. energy of its own. Yeah, so can Liam, can I chase down that thought with you? Because yeah. that's where we need to go. So, guys, and this isn't exactly where Liam was going, but I think it'll scratch an itch. Guys, we, a minute ago, when you were talking, we're talking about a question. And the question was not, where is energy stored? The question is, how is energy stored? And guys, here's the thing that's interesting. Every single one of these energy storage locations stores energy the exact same way. So now let's talk about the question, how is energy stored? There's one answer and it's contained in all of these. You ready? This is fascinating. Guys, my, my board's gonna freak out, so let me just let it freak out right now. So guys, do you understand the question that we're chasing down? Not where is energy stored, wonderful answers. So guys, how is energy stored? And the answer is surprising. The thing that these all have in common is position. So let's talk about it. You ready for a little foreshadowing? Guys, we're going to pretend that this table is the floor because it's easier to see the table than the floor. Here's a block. It's the brass block. It's the brass block. Guys, if we want this block to have more energy, we lift it. Now it has energy that it didn't previously. Why does it now have energy that it didn't before? Because it can fall. Position. It can now fall. But guys, if we were in outer space, this change in position wouldn't matter. So it's not just position. <coughs> what else has to be present? Gravity. Attraction. And guys, that's the complete picture. It is position relative to attraction. Let me make sure that's my next bullet point. Yeah, here we go. So guys, it is actually energy stored 
relative to an object's attraction for other objects. Just a second. So guys, now let's talk about position and attraction. It was relatively obvious when we talked about gravity. But guys, a lot of the other things we talked about, food, fuels, those energies are stored in chemical bonds. So guys, let's talk about this. Whether it's ionic or covalent, check this out. In an ionic bond, we have a positive and a negative. What is the attraction? Yeah, and guys, there's a name for this. Don't write it down. We'll talk about it later. It is called a Coulombic attraction. It is the attraction between dissimilar charges. So guys, we have, we have position and we have attraction. We can store energy there. But then guys, if we're talking about, I'm sort of out of space, I'll write it over here. Bunsen burner gas, which is methane. We see the position, where's the attraction? But let's talk about how. Guys, what does this C really represent? Uh, the, carbon. the nucleus of carbon. What does that H represent? The nucleus of hydrogen, a proton. Both of those are positive, right? What does the line represent? A cloud of negatives. And guys, now we've got negative and positives, and now we've got attraction, and we can store energy there. What about, who said the nuclei? Sorry, I'm picking up. John, where's the attraction? In the nucleus of an atom, say it again. Strong force. Guys, this strong force actually creates an attraction that shouldn't be there. And guys, please hear this. I know that we've thought of the strong force like some sort of like weird force field that holds the nuclei together. The better analogy, which you learned last year in class, remember the video with the bungee cords? Guys, the strong force doesn't exist around the nucleus. The strong force exists within the nucleus. It is a strange attractive force that overcomes the repulsion of the protons that links them together. Again, attraction where energy can be stored. You getting the ideas? Please. Uh, when you say strange force, does that mean we still don't know what it is? No, actually it's interesting. We, we understand the strong force <coughs> better than we understand gravity. It's really interesting. I don't know if you're aware of this. And guys, if you would like me to, um, I, I am, I am a self-professed nerd. Um, forgive me, and I'm recording this, but guys, for me, sorry, it's frankly a form of worship. Like, when I look into the just the amazing universe that we live in, it takes my breath away. Um, and I love, especially with what's going on with the James Webb Space Telescope, I just can't get enough. And so, Nathaniel, to your question, um, Right now, we are, based on James Webb data, we are uncovering things that are beginning to suggest that we don't understand how gravity works. Um, there's Newtonian gravity, and then there's um, the gravity that Einstein suggested, which is a warping of space-time. Um, and they're beginning to think that there's actually a quantumness to gravity. Um, that we're just beginning to understand. It's fascinating. Yeah. 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 So um, if you guys would like, as I run into these videos, and I'm happy to not do this, but if you would, I'm happy to throw them on our group me if you'd like to see them. Um, some of them are just like, wow, it's crazy. Anyway. All right. So are we good on this idea of storing energy? Go ahead, Adam. So in the example of the nucleus, um, when the energy is released, yeah. The so I'm just trying to think of it as like the position relative to attraction. The attraction is holding the the nucleus together, 
and the yeah. the, 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 the Coulombic force mm -hmm. between the protons right. is pushing it apart. Yep. So <laughs> when the nucleus is broken yeah. and the, the strong force is overcome yeah. and it, you know, breaks apart, yeah. and all the energy is released, is the energy coming from yeah. the, 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 the breaking of the strong force, or right. is it the, the, the force of the protons pushing each other away as the strong force is overcome? And the answer is neither. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about it. Um, and guys, we're not going to do a deep dive on this right now. But Adam, in order to answer your question, and guys, frankly, what we just talked about relative to energy storage is actually not the complete picture. So guys, join me at the screen and let's talk. So sorry this is so mucky mucked, but can this be methane? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And what we've said is that those bonds store energy. But guys, that's not the complete picture. Think through this with me. The energy that is stored in those bonds is potential energy, right? So how do we extract, and then we'll get to the nuclei, how do we extract energy from these bonds? I'm going to redraw this. So how do we extract energy from these bonds? And the answer is... form new better bonds. So guys, understand, let's say it this way. In order for methane and oxygen to turn into carbon dioxide and water, what you're going to learn later in this unit is that these bonds, and let's write O2 out, guys, these bonds have got to break. Those molecules, listen to the word, have got to decompose. Is decomposition endo or exothermic? Always end up. Guys, if you want to smash a rock, you got to hit it with a hammer. Breaking bonds is always endothermic. So the breaking down, so be careful. And I wouldn't have left this unaddressed. We were just going to address it later. Guys, the breaking of these bonds is endothermic. The place where energy is released is when these bonds form. So in that state on the left, there is, and this is how to think about it, there is the potential to form other bonds. And it's that potential that we can access, if you will, by carrying out a chemical reaction that then forms, Nathaniel, I actually like the way he said it, that forms new better bonds. And those new better bonds, we'll talk about Hess's law in a couple days, the new better bonds have less energy than the bonds we started with. And guys, it's literally like this. We have the energy of bonds, the methane and the oxygen. And when they break apart, we now have the potential. Oh, this is good. We now have the potential to fall to a lower energy position. <coughs> That's the carbon dioxide in the water. And that potential energy is converted to work and heat. Um, as these new, better, lower energy bonds form. See how that all fits together? Let me finish. Um, so then, uh, Adam, to your question about the strong nuclear force, completely different game. Um, what happens in those nuclear processes is not the breaking and forming of new nuclei, right? It, game over. What happens is, is a, when, when the strong nuclear force is overcome, a little bit of the mass of the nucleus is converted to energy. That's E equals mc squared. And so the process of energy recovery in nuclear processes is completely different than this. Right. So I guess that just makes it difficult for me to oh, yeah. imagine the potential energy as like a positional thing. Yeah, right. So is it... So where's the potential energy coming through with the attraction if the energy is just coming from converted mass? In the nucleus, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so we don't have the calculus background to talk about it. Because what it actually boils down to, and I can show you, I can send you a video on this. Um, what it really boils down to are what happens to the quarks that make up, let's leave it there. 
Okay. It's a little crazier. Go ahead, Noah. But I was just want to ask, does that mean that the strong nuclear force like has mass to it, and if you break it, it turns into energy? No, forces don't have mass. Forces gets even worse. Sorry, I don't want to chase down a lot of rabbit trails, but why do, have, why do things have mass in the first place? And we know the answer. It's because these particles interact with what are called Higgs bosons. And it's the Higgs boson that actually imparts mass to everything. There's a thing called the Higgs field. We'll talk more about fields later. Um, but for every particle, because you understand this, for every particle that exists in the universe, there's a field that supports it. There's an electron field, there's a photon field, there's a proton, well, sort of, because they're made of quarks, there are quark fields. And guys, every single particle that exists in this universe is actually an excitation of its field. We'll talk about it um, Go ahead. Well, this, is, this is unrelated to what we just talked about, but yeah. when you mentioned the falling of energy and the yeah. thing, yeah. it reminded yeah. me of the lab we did in Gen Chem, yeah. where we talked about like the different like electrons falling yes. back down. Yes, 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 yes. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, and so there, we have a higher energy position, the excited state. We have a lower energy position, the ground state. And when that electron transfers from one to the other, um, it releases that energy in the form of a photon. Yeah. So guys, fundamentally, here's the deal. How do we store energy? It's about attraction and position. So if you can walk out of here understanding attraction and position, you're good to go. So guys, what does that then do for us? Well, it goes like this, attraction and position. So you don't even need to write these down. But guys, this is where we are going to leave the list. And actually, there's one more to add to this. So guys, if you can track down the idea of gravitational potential energy, we will never, that's physics. We don't do gravitational potential energy in this class, but it still provides a great analogy. In the same way, oh, there's my block. In the same way, and Liam, I love what you did there. In the same way that this falling block is not unlike a falling electron, it's a great foundation. But guys, for us, the one that we're going to talk about is electrostatic um, potential energy. And guys, that is the attraction between um, charged particles. We understand we call that a Coulombic attraction. Well, don't write it down. And guys, this is protons and electrons in covalent bonding, ions in an ionic bond, and then the IMFs between polar molecules. If you're okay with that, it's a good enough foundation. We okay? Okay, so guys, we're going to pick up the pace just a little bit, um, not because we're hurrying, but because now we just need to talk about some fundamental stuff that's really straightforward. So guys, this total internal energy, this is a term you need to know. Who was it that said the energy, Liam, was that you that said the energy stored in you yeah. earlier? That's kind of what this is about. And Liam, um, we're going to go front row Liam and back row Liam. So guys, back row Liam was talking about the idea of having to wrap his head around this idea that there's just energy everywhere. But guys, the problem is, is that we need to be more detailed than that. And so in this class, we're going to talk about what is called total internal energy. And the total internal energy is just the sum of all the kinetic and potential energy within a system, within Let's, and guys, please use the word system. We're going to do a deeper dive than that in just a few minutes. So a term you need to know, total internal energy, and it is the amount of energy contained within a system. The sum of the kinetic and potential energies. And guys, we should say this. There's only two ways to change something, right? Work and heat. There's only two kinds of energy. Kinetic and potential. That's not like dumbed down high school stuff. That's the list. It's kinetic or potential, and that's it. So if we're adding, if we're doing the sum, how do we 
measure potential energy. Yeah, that's a great so many question. Ways, like, Absolutely. It could fall somewhere. Yeah. You could, mm -hmm. you could burn it. You could eat it. You could. Burn yeah. It. You ready for the answer? So Sharp's question is, how do we measure this energy? And the answer is, we don't. What we actually measure is not energy. And this is going to get weird. We're not going to do a deep dive now. We don't measure energy. We measure energy change. No, that's not. It doesn't really make sense. No, it doesn't make sense at all. Because if <laughs> you want to measure change, change, you need to know before and after. So if you can't measure before and if you can't measure after, how can you measure the change? And the answer, and we're going to do more on this in the coming days. We're not going to dig now. But the answer is we watch how energy affects something else. <coughs> So for example, the way we're going to do calorimetry is we're going to do chemical reactions. Um, specifically, we're going to do hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. We can't measure the energy in the, in the sodium hydroxide or the hydrochloric acid. But what we can do is when they react together, they release heat. That's one of the ways energy is transferred. And we use that to heat water. And by knowing how much energy the water absorbed because it makes the temperature change, we can figure out how much energy that reaction lost or gained. So when we measure energy, we're actually left to measure how the gaining or losing of energy changes something else. Um, you're going to see Sterling when, or Sterling, yeah, sorry, Sharp. <laughs> you're going to see, Sharp, when you get into this, um, when you get in, and guys, be careful of this. When you get into chapter five, one of the things that's going to blow your mind are what are called um, state functions. In this class, and there are chemistry teachers that tell me I'm, this is like blasphemy, we don't talk about state functions. So when you get to it in chapter five, you're welcome to read it, but don't get crazy about it. Because that idea of not being able to directly measure something, but measuring how it changes something else is all about the logic of state functions. And I find getting into it really deep just causes a lot of confusion. But there is an answer to it. Okay. How are we doing, y'all? We've been talking about a lot of stuff. Let's bring this together. So here's what we know. We've got kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. We have potential energy, which is stored energy. In this class, we store energy between charged things. Then, guys, we talk about the total internal energy of a system, and that is the kinetic and potential energy, the sum of those for that system. Is that okay? Okay, this one's going to go a little quicker, guys. Units for energy, we already talked about it. Guys, when we measure energy, we have the joule. We've already written this down. It is the amount of energy that a two kilogram mass possesses traveling at one meter per second. But guys, this is not very much energy. So instead of using joules, we will use kilojoules, thousands of joules. Then guys, the other one that we know is the calorie. Guys, this you need to write down. The calorie is the amount of energy that is required to raise one gram of water's temperature, one degree Celsius. That's a definition you need to know. I don't know why that weird space is there. The amount, shouldn't it be the amount of energy you need Thank you. So guys, trying this again, it's the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water's temperature one degree Celsius. But not surprisingly, there is a relationship. Guys, one calorie is about four joules. So a joule is a fourth of a calorie. The exact number is 4.184. But if that gives you a sense of this, a joule is a fourth of a calorie. But now, guys, it gets even crazier because where in your world do you interact with calories? Your food. But guys, watch. The calories on the back of your food are not these. This is not that calorie. Guys, the calories that we think in are dietary calories. And guys, dietary calories are actually kilocalories. 
So when you eat a Snickers bar and that Snickers bar provides you 250 calories, what it's actually providing you is 250,000 of those calories. So guys, if you're on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, you are actually eating 2 million calories defined by the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water's temperature one degree Celsius. Hold on, go. Eight joules. Eight, eight million joules. Well, and here's the thing that's interesting. In Europe, food has its, has its caloric value, its, its energy values in kilojoules. Yeah. So like this little thing of, of, a, of <coughs> M&Ms, um, if you eat the whole bag, it's 2,144 kilojoules. But then they also give it in calories, but they don't use dietary calories, they use K counts, thousands of calories. So guys, on the back of this, this bag of, pe of what M&Ms is using round numbers, 2,000 kilojoules or 500 kilocalories. But 2,500 is related by four, so again, four kilojoules is a kilocalorie. Huh? That's a lot of calories per It's a lot of calories, yeah. So the question then becomes, why don't we burst into flames, right? We're more than one gram. <laughs> We're more than one gram, and also our bodies are wildly inefficient. Um, and we're also really good at storing calories. <laughs> All right. So, guys, you good on the units? Please. The, just like, um, or clearing that, but the little C is the one that we eat, and then the big C is going to be like the calories. No, so the big C is our, is our dietary calorie. Oh. The little c is is the calorie that we'll talk about in chemistry. Okay. Is that okay? All right. All right. So guys, now we need to do some more terms and definitions, and then guys, we are going to play with our block. Ready? These are terms and definitions that you need to know. Write them down. Here we go. So guys, the first term that you need to know is system. We've already loosely talked about this, but now let's define it. Guys, the system is the portion of the universe that we are studying. Now guys, understand, I know this sounds sort of nebulous, but one of the more difficult things that you will do in this unit is identify your system. Because guys, if you don't properly identify your system, the math that you're going to try to bring to bear on chemical processes is not going to work because your picture is too big. So guys, the system is the part of the universe that we are studying. So the minute you identify your system, everything else becomes the surroundings. So the world's dumbest equation would say system plus surroundings equals universe. Right? <laughs> Like, it's not bad. I gotta just take a system and some and everything else and add them up and you get the universe. I just thought of a thing I saw where someone like put the wrapping. Please don't let this be a meme. No, no, someone put the oh. wrapping paper on a box inside out so the outside was facing so the outside was facing the rest of the world and they were like, oh, I got every object in the universe except for this pair of headphones. There. The no, 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 I understand. I actually like that. <laughs> That's not bad. Okay. So, guys, with this set of important points, which are also terms you need to know. Guys, in this class, our systems will always be what we call closed systems. And, guys, understand this is a word that is universal to the AP curriculum. You will be using this word on the AP test. Understand that AP graders know what this means. So guys, a closed system is a system in which two things are true. Number one, energy can get in and out. But number two, matter cannot get in and out. So energy can be exchanged, matter cannot. 
Therefore, what law always holds? The law of conservation of mass. Yay! Let's not break that. Okay, so guys, here's what we now know. The system is the part of the universe we're studying. The surroundings is everything else. And our frame of reference will always be closed systems in which energy can move around but matter can't, okay? Now this. We are now going to focus for the rest of the day about how, how energy can be exchanged. Guys, how does energy get in or out of a system? You ready? Work or heat? Or heat. So guys, let's dig into those more deeply. Guys, there are two ways to affect the energy of a system. Let's use our term. The total, oh, I forgot the word total. Sorry. The total, there we go. Guys, there are two ways to affect the total internal energy of a system. Work and heat. You're not gonna like the abbreviations. Heat is Q, work is W. Why? Because it gets even worse. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait until you get into enthalpy, which is actually heat in the absence of work, and that's abbreviated H. What? Oh, yeah. What? It gets worse. Oh, heat in the absence of work is H. Maybe. So that works. <laughs> oh, get it? Works? All right. Oh, does it work? All right. So guys, let's define this. What is work? Work is energy used to cause an object to move against a force. So what is a force? A force is any kind of push or pull exerted on an object. Done and dusted. <laughs> All right, so guys, you ready? Work requires two things, movement and resistance. So guys, if you are driving down State Street, which is now eternally under construction, okay, it's awful. and if you see a bunch of guys leaning on their shovels, watching one guy in the backhoe dig a hole and you think to yourself all those guys aren't doing work is that true no, no. they're doing work they're pushing themselves off the ground of the shovel. but they're not moving but they're not moving uh, guys there has to be movement for there to be work yes okay now this guys what if you see a spaceship traveling through the vacuum of space is work being done on that spaceship <laughs> and that's where we and guys this gets a little physicsy so let's keep it simple what is missing in space for work to be done resistance, resistance. there's no air resistance but Nathaniel you're not wrong um, if the rocket was to go off and that thing was to accelerate, work would be done. But what's the resistance? Inertia. Inertia. We don't need to talk about it. Um, so guys, fundamentally the idea is this. There's got to be movement and there's got to be resistance. If you're missing either of those, you ain't doing no work. So guys, we don't have to worry about this anymore. We'll just get rid of it. Yeah, we'll leave it. Um, so guys, work is then force times distance. This place. And then guys, this. Heat. Heat is the transfer of kinetic energy. Let me keep going for a minute. 
Heat is the transfer of kinetic energy from hot to cold. So you have to have something cold. Yes. If two things are the same temperature, heat cannot transfer. Is that okay? So heat, so heat transfer requires the temperatures to be different? Requires the temperatures to be different. But guys, please, I just, I feel a responsibility to connect with your physics background. If that doesn't exist for you, what we're about to talk about, you don't need to worry about. But guys, how does that happen? How does heat transfer from hot to cold? The way that we will talk about is conduction contact. So if you think about it, if you've got something hot and it's moving really fast, and if you've got something cold and it's moving really slow, when hot and cold come together, hot will run into cold, and the hot stuff transfers energy to the cold stuff, and the hot stuff speeds up, and the cold stuff speeds down, and eventually they're going the same speed. That's what you need to understand. It's called conduction. Guys, there's other ways, though, to do this, like convection. That is kinetic energy traveling through air. There's radiation, kinetic energy traveling through electromagnetics. But guys, all you need to know is about contact, which is conduction. Okay? But then, Sharp, you said something interesting. So you've got to have hot and you've got to have cold. Guys, you've got to understand this. There's no such thing as cold. It's... <laughs> Relative. First, it's, salt water isn't real. And now cold. Yeah, see, now cold's not a thing. I guess winter just isn't a thing. I either. know. <laughs> cats and dogs living together. Uh, you but guys, really fundamentally, the idea is this. These are all relative terms. You can't say something's hot. You can just say something is hotter than something else. And guys, energy, and this is, we don't get many alwayses in this class, but guys, energy in the form of heat can only travel from something that's hot to something that's cold. In the same way that blocks can only fall down, heat can only go from high energy, hot, to low energy, cold. It can't flow the other direction. So you can make something less hot, but it's actually transferring energy to the cold thing. Not Every cold time. That's how an air conditioner works, right? What it's doing is it's actually extracting heat out of the air in your home. That makes the air colder. Then what it does is it dumps that heat into the air outside. So what's happening is, is you're, you're removing heat from the air inside and dumping it outside. Yeah. So with what you're saying about heat transfer, uh -huh. conduction. Yep. Keep going. Vibration differences into each other. Does that mean that things that are super good conducting heat are just sponges that are really good at dispersing vibrations? That's wow. And and interestingly, wow. Um, I'm going to do my best to repeat what you said. Correct me when you need. But guys, the thought is is liquid. If if you have substances that are really good at conducting heat, are they just substances that transfer wiggle really well? And the answer is yes. Um, so for example, and guys feel free to do this if you want, if you put your hand on the leg of your table, and then if you put your hand on the top of the table, which one feels cold? The leg, the leg right? Why? And the answer is because the leg is a regular metallic crystalline solid and it transfers wiggle better than the wood, which is actually more, we call it amorphous. There isn't a real repeated structure to it. And so this transfers heat better than this because it transfers wiggle better. And so to us it feels cold because it's absorbing more heat out of our hand. Um, that's also why air is such a good insulator. Uh, because the air molecules are so spread out that they don't transfer wiggle very well. It's also why vacuums are the best insulator. Because like, there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing. So like literally, if you were to take my coffee cup and cut it in half, you would see an inner wall and you would see an outer wall, and there's nothing in between. And in that nothingness, there's no contact, so there's no conduction. Yeah, it's a thermos. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great point. We're not, however, because at this point we got to be careful because your mind starts to wander and you're like, well, is it related to density? Is it related? Don't chase down that rabbit trail. It's that's where you start getting into material and composite physics, and that's beyond what we're going to do. Liam, you've been waiting, I think, haven't you? Or Dallin, you've been yes. waiting. So my question was, um, it just has to do with the equation for. Um, the work. Yeah. Um, is there any specific reason why the W and the D are lowercase while the F is uppercase? Or was that just. I don't know. I think that's usually how it works for that. You guys okay? All right. So, guys, here's what I want you to do I want you to put your notes away. Not away, away, but just out of sight. Oh, sorry. Is there a work part of the notes? Yep. It needs, it needs a resistance and movement. And movement. Okay. Yep. So where is that related here? Here's your resistance, the force. Distance is your movement. Okay. It has to move. Yeah. yeah we might have gone over this, but so when it, it's kinetic energy, when it's com when it's going from hot to cold, and that's because it's like like it's like the energy is falling. Like, Right, like it's yeah. moving, but yeah. when it's going from cold to hot, it does it. So, but so what is going from cold? Like from so yeah. Sorry, I'm so cutting you off. Keep going. No, no, I just I don't know because it's like so you can heat something up, you can make it hotter. Uh -huh. So what energy is that? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean the Bunsen burner, right? So yeah. we use Bunsen burners to heat up water. So how does that work? And the answer is, in a combustion reaction, there is so much energy being released. We'll talk more about the chemistry in a couple of days. But as the bonds form, when carbon dioxide and water are formed, there's so much energy released that those particles are super accelerated. They're moving like bonkers, way faster. And let's just say the flame is in contact with the water. We know there's glass in between. But the particles of gas that are being excited by that combustion reaction are moving way faster than the water. And so all of that wiggle energy down here in those excited gas particles are running into the water molecules. And when they do, they release energy into the water molecules. And we see that. Joules. I'm sorry? We would measure the amount of energy that's released in joules. So we can measure how much energy goes from the flame to the water, and we can measure that in joules. But fundamentally, the idea is the gas molecules are moving faster than the water molecules. And you know that because the flame is hotter than the water. And so when the flame, when the gas molecules and the water molecules run into each other, well, it's just glass in between. But um, the gas molecules slow down as they run into the flame molecules, or the water molecules, and they speed up. Is that okay? You sure? So this whole idea, though, guys, about hot going to cold but not cold to hot, if that's confusing to you, think about it this way. If you've got a rich person and a poor person, which way is the money going to flow? Well, it depends on if you're a Democrat or a Republican. But and it depends on which group of rich person you're talking about. Yeah. So, but guys, at the end of the day, more can give to less, but less can't give to more. Right? That's the fundamental principle. Okay, you ready? So guys, this may take us a little bit through the bell. That's fine. We're going to hang. Um, and then we're going to have to talk about homework because it's a disaster. Oh, no. You'll, you'll see. All right, so guys, ready? We are going to talk about this block, okay? And this block, by my choosing, is now our system. So guys, if that block is our system, what does that make you? Surroundings. Surroundings. What does that make me? What does that make the table? What does that make the air? Surroundings. Good. Okay. So now, guys, we are going, and we don't really do this, but let me be just the surroundings. So, guys, right now, let's talk about the total internal energy of this block. Does this block have kinetic energy? And guys, this is where we've got to be careful because we understand that the particles inside here are moving. So it does have some atomic kinetic energy. We're going to talk about the block as a whole. So does that block have any kinetic energy? 
because it's not moving. It has mass, but it's not moving. Now, guys, we're going to pretend that our table is the floor. So does this block have any kinet or a potential energy? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't because it can't fall. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Now, guys, this. We are going to give this block some energy. But guys, where does that energy have to come from? Outside. The surroundings. Guys, there's a principle in our universe that says systems can't affect themselves. If that block is going to get energy, be it kinetic or potential, the only place it can come from is the surroundings. Let me just roll. So, guys, I'm going to be the surroundings, and I'm going to give this block some energy. You ready? So I'm going to grab a hold of it, and I'm going to lift it. Now, let's talk about the total internal energy of this block. Does it have kinetic energy? No. Minus the fact that I'm shaking a little bit. But, guys, does this block have uh, kinetic energy? Not currently, no. Potential energy. Yes. It does. Now, here's the question, guys. Where did that energy come from? Me, the surroundings, and guys, ready? Be careful. How did I give that block energy? Work. I did work. And guys, your answer's got to be one of those two. It's got to be work or it's got to be heat. So guys, let's watch me do work. So the work is me lifting this. But in order for there to be work, there has to be two things. Resistance. What's the resistance? Gravity. gravity. We're going to pretend like there is no air resistance. Thank you. So, guys, the resistance is gravity, and you can see this move, and therefore we have work. And so, guys, here's an interesting question. Um, let's say, let's just use 100. So, I did 100 joules of work on this block. How much potential energy does it have right now? 100 joules. So guys, we're going to find this out later. The it's a law of thermodynamics. The energy that goes in has to be the energy that comes out. So guys, I am doing 100 joules of work. Now this block has 100 joules of potential energy. Because we're pretending friction is real. We're, and again, in a vacuum. Right. If we could measure, because realize that air friction creates heat, and if we could keep track of both, it would still work out. The accounting still works. We're just not going to do air friction. Okay, so here we go again. Total internal energy, zero. Lift it, I've now done work. We're going to stay. I've now done work. This has now got 100 joules of energy, right? Kinetic or potential? Potential. Now, guys, watch. I'm going to let go of this block. And when I do, it's going to fall. And guys, as this block falls, what is happening to its potential energy? It's decreasing. What is happening to its kinetic energy? It is increasing. So guys, what is the total internal energy of the block right here? 100 joules. What is it right there? Still 100 joules. But guys, what's happening is potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. How do we know that the kinetic energy is going up? It's moving. Ah. It's velocity is going up. Remember, kinetic energy is mass and velocity, and this ain't getting heavier. It's moving faster. You get the idea? Okay. Now, guys, I've got to sit down. Okay, so now guys say that this block is now at that same level. What's its energy? 100 joules. And as the block falls, what is happening to potential energy? Going down. What's happening to kinetic energy? Going up. What happens to total internal energy? All right. And then, guys, it is one bamillionth of a trillionth of a zillionth of a little thing right above the table. And guys, what is its potential energy functionally now? Zero. Okay? Let's say it has nowhere else to fall. So its potential energy is now zero. What is its kinetic energy? Does that make sense? It's 100? And then, guys, it hits the tape. Now let's talk. What is its total internal energy now? Zero. Zero. Where did the energy go? 
into the table in the form of heat and work. So guys, what happened? Well, the clock does work on the table. And that causes the molecules in the table to vibrate. And literally, it heats up the table. But guys, that's not where most of the energy went. Where did most of the energy go? Sound. Sound. But guys, in order to create sound, you have to do work. The particles push on the air, force over a distance. And this wave propagates through the air. There's our distance, and it's transferring energy. And then that hits our ears, and it does work on our eardrums, and we can hear it. But guys, all of the energy is dissipated in the form of work as it makes these molecules vibrate. Well, it's actually kind of heat. Makes these vibrate more, and work being done in the air as it makes our ears wiggle. But guys, here's the thing. The end of this was making your ears wiggle. But guys, this is deep. Where did that energy come from to make your ears wiggle? From you. From me. But guys, where did I get my energy? From food. And where did my... Dallin, your timing couldn't have been better. Where did my delicious piece of food, cow, get its energy? Where did it get its That's delicious. Where did it get its energy? Grass. From grass. And where did grass get its energy? The sun. And guys, where did the sun get its energy? Right. But here's the thing you gotta understand. Ultimately, guys, every energetic process that happens here on Earth its energy can be tracked back to the sun. Now it's going to get even worse because what you're going to find out, sorry, this is really gross. Try it. Not the food, me chewing. No. <laughs> food's delicious. It's food's delicious. Like, like, no, it's delicious. delicious. <laughs> so guys, here's the thing you're going to find out in chapter 19. As much as the sun is a source of energy for us, it's also a source of disorder for us. And that's what entropy is, and we're going to talk later about so, guys, rounding up final questions on our little block thing. Go ahead. What about the meteorite that killed the dinosaurs? That might have come from outside or something. Yeah. That's yeah. <coughs> geothermal energy. Still, still. <laughs> yeah. All right, so guys, we have a problem. Guys, the problem is this. Um, I sat down last night. To pull our, and you guys understand what I'm going through with the homework, right? Um, that I'm having to take last year's homework and convert it into this year's homework from the book. And for the most part, this has gone well. Um, but interestingly, in this chapter, they asked a bunch of questions that there was no suitable replacement for, and they just got rid of them. So, guys, what I'm going to end up having to do is retype the questions out of the book um, because there are questions that you need to understand and they're no longer in the new book. I was kind of disappointed. Okay, guess, frankly, I didn't have time to do it last night because I had watched the BYU-Utah volleyball game. Three times. <laughs> it was, although, go Cougs. Last night they got more people into the Smith Field House than ever before. 5,528 people inside. I'm sure they were violating fire codes like crazy. Well, fire um, code is an important. No, it's volleyball. <laughs> yeah. Um, so guys, what this means is is the homework assignment is not yet ready for you um, because it's gonna. I'm gonna work on it after lunch today. Um, so we're gonna have to give this a little. Oh shoot. We're going to have to give this a little more time. Um, so guys, um, here's what you're going to have to do. Um, this is not, oh wait, we'll do our, our summary really quick. Guys, we get on this. Energy can go from kinetic to potential or potential to kinetic with no net change in internal energy. If we want to change internal energy, there's only two ways to do it. What is it? Heat and work. Heat and work. Okay. So guys, this is not your homework. 
But what you are going to have to do to get your homework assignment today after school is get on our website, access the slides from today, and it will be on there. And the solutions will also be updated. Okay. So, guys, let's take a break. Come back and we'll get to lab. Yes, it's time to play with silver.